going to spend this last week looking at graphs and trees. So it turns out we've actually already gra used graphs and trees in this course, and you're probably familiar with them from other mathematical courses that you've taken. For example, when we had a look at experiments and sample spaces, one way of listing the elements of a sample space whose outcomes are all possible genders of two children would be to draw the probability tree that we have below. But graphs can also be used to model any kind of relation and process in physical, biological, social and information systems. For example, in computer science in particular, communication networks can be modelled with graphs, data organisation, flow of computation and website structure. But you can even find graphs appearing in humanities. For example, you can create a graph about the structure of how various languages are linked. So in li linguistics, we have a language groups diagram. And this helps you see that there are a bunch of languages that come from similar roots. Romance languages come from a different set of roots. And there are some links together. And then we have Slavic languages, which all form close links together. And then occasionally you have some some languages which are very distantly linked. For example, Hungarian, Estonian, and Finnish are all kind of off on their own. And this is a useful way of visualizing how various languages are linked together. And there's a lot of information if you look at this, because you'll notice the size of what we will call the vertices tells you information about how many speakers there are, and then the distance between various vertices gives you some information on how closely linked the languages are. So for example, you might see that um, Portuguese and Spanish are quite closely linked as two Romance languages, but French and Portuguese, while they are both Romance languages, are more distantly linked. So graphs give us a very compact way of storing and displaying quite a lot of information. So let's start right at the beginning. What do we mean by a graph? So we're going to build on this definition, but in general, a graph consists of a set of vertices. So we're thinking of these as the nodes of the graph. And a set of edges. So these are the lines joining our vertices or our nodes. And it's important here that we are saying we have a set of vertices. So we are thinking of a set of vertices as an actual mathematical set of objects. So you might have vertex 1, vertex 2, all the way up to here in this diagram we've got vertex 7. So you'll see we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 vertices in this particular diagram. And then we've got a set of edges connecting the various vertices. So obviously the way we need to describe an edge is using the pair of vertices that it connects. So here we would have our set of vertices. So our first edge is E1 and that connects vertex 1 to vertex 4. So we have V1, V4, so that we're thinking of that as describing edge 1. And we'd keep going our next vertex, which is labeled E2, links vertex 2 and vertex 3, and so on. In terms of drawing a graph, we can draw the graph with edges that are straight or curved, and we should always make sure that both ends of an edge connect to a vertex. Now, you, it's quite okay to have an edge which connects the same vertex to itself, so this is called a loop. Um, and you can also have vertices that aren't connected, but you can never have just an edge by itself that isn't connected to two vertices. Okay, so just to introduce a little bit more um, 
a few more definitions. As I mentioned previously, if we've got an edge with just one endpoint, it's called a loop. So our loop always looks like some vertex and then an edge that starts and ends at that same vertex. And if we happen to have two or more edges which are different but have the same endpoints, so they start and end at the same place, then we say that these two edges are parallel. So E1 and E2 are parallel. And then if we want to talk about um, how an edge is connected, we say exactly that. We say an edge connects its endpoints. And if we have two vertices that are connect connected by an edge, then we say that these two are adjacent. So here we have V1 and V2 are adjacent. And if we have a vertex that is an endpoint of a loop, then we say that V is adjacent to itself. Just a few more bits of vocabulary. An edge is said to be incident on each of its endpoints. So our vertices are adjacent, but our edge is incident on our vertices V1 and V2. And if we have two edges that are incident on the same endpoints, they're called adjacent. Or, uh, it doesn't have to be both endpoints, but just the same. So for example, we could have, here we have three vertices, and we have two edges. And notice that edge 1 and edge 2 are both incident on V2, so we call those two adjacent. So because E1 and E2 are both incident on V2, they are adjacent. And then if we have one little vertex sitting all by itself with no edges connected to it, it's isolated. So in order to practice a little bit of the notation that we've been developing here, let's look at the following graph. So notice that even though it looks like I have three separate things here, we are thinking of this whole thing as one graph. So it has bits that are not connected to each other, but we're thinking of all of these. So take a moment, and the first thing we'd like is to write down the vertex set, and then write down the edge set. So you might want to stop the video and write down your answers and then come back and check. So if you want to check what you've written, we've got a vertex set which consists of six vertices and then we have an edge set which consists of five edges. Now you don't always label the edges so sometimes you're just going to have to use the vertices in order to identify your edges in which case we'll have the sets V1, V2, or rather the pair V1, V2, V1, V3, V1, V3, and V1, V3 again. So you might at this point be saying, well, this isn't a proper set because we're not allowed to repeat elements. And in fact, in this case, we would actually call this a multi-set because we, it is important because we want to make sure that we have all the edges and we have two edges connecting V1 and V3, so we are duplicating elements. And if you carried on, you would see that you had 
v2, v3, v5, v5. So that's indicating a loop. We have v5 and v6, and then we have another loop, v6 and v6. So usually this is how you would write the edge set. Okay, so now let's have a look at part B. We want to firstly find all the edges that are incident on V1. So that means we want to look at V1 and find all the edges which have one endpoint as V1. So if we have a look over here, we've got edge E1 and E2 and E3 are all incident on V1. So it's going to be E1, E2 and E3. So next we want to have a look at vertices that are adjacent to V1. So vertices are adjacent if they share an edge. So if we have a look, here we've got V1, and if we go along E1, we get to E2. If we go along E2 or E3, then we get to V3. So V2 and V3 are the two vertices that are adjacent to V1. and V3. Now we want to think about edges that are adjacent to E1. So these are edges that are joined to E1 via some vertex. So let's have a look. So we've got our edge E1 and then if we go through V1, we'll see that we've got E2 and E3 are adjacent. On the other hand, if we start at V2, then we've got that E4 is also adjacent. So we've got adjacent edges are... E2, E3, and E4. Okay, let's have a look and see. We want to identify all the loops. So let's have some blue. So we've got all our loops. Well, our loops are E6 and also E7. So our loops the edges E6 and E7. Now we're having a look for parallel edges. So parallel edges, remember, start and end at the same vertices. And if we have a look here, I'm not going to mark it because it'll make the diagram a bit too confused, but we have a look and we see we have V1 linking V3 via E2 and E3. So parallel edges are E2 and E3. Okay, and then we want vertices that are adjacent to themselves. So these are vertices that have a loop. And so we can have a look here. Vertex V5 and vertex V6 both have a loop attached to them so they're adjacent to themselves. So that's V5 and V6. And then finally, isolated vertices. We only have one little old isolated vertex which is V4, sitting all by itself.
So this was just to work through giving examples of all the notation that we've learned so far. So we're going to learn several different kinds of graphs. The first idea is the idea of a simple graph, which is a graph that doesn't have any loops, so we don't have any cases of a vertex that's connected to itself by an edge, and we don't have any parallel edges. So if we have two vertices in a simple graph, they're connected by at most one edge. We don't allow multiple connections. And in a simple graph with an, ed an edge which has endpoints V and W is denote de denoted as this little set VW. So previously we'd used um, round brackets, but now we're going to specify if it's a simple graph, then we're using set notation. Okay, so now we have the idea of a simple graph, but we can actually go further. So the first kind of graph to study is called an undirected graph. And an undirected graph really just consists of our vertex set and our edge set, as we've seen before. And when we're connecting, or when we're drawing our edges, we just draw a line connecting the vertices. And often in undirected graphs, we are often saying we don't allow loops, so these tend to be simple. The kind of thing that you might use as an undirected graph to model could be, for example, a computer network where you've got um, five computers and they're linked. Um, some of them are linked, some of them are not linked. It'll become clear why we're making a big deal of undirected graphs when we get to graph uh, to directed graphs. Another example that you're probably familiar with, although without thinking about it, is the idea of an island road map. And here we have the notation that we're using for an undirected graph. So we're using, we have the vertex set and also the edge set. In contrast, we have the idea of a simple directed graph, which again has a set of vertices and a set of edges. But in this kind of graph, what we want to do is we want to specify a direction on each edge. So you'll notice our vertices are described just as before, but now if you have a look at an edge on a directed graph, we've got an arrow. So this is often indicating some kind of flow from one vertex to another or things like that. And in this case, we will use round brackets. So we're indicating here that we have a direction here. This says, this is the edge from S to A. On the other hand, if we have a look at going in the opposite direction, then you get to say that this edge that I just indicated here is the edge that goes from B to A. So this edge would go from A to B. So although they have the same letters in them, because we're using a kind of coordinates here, it, the order is important. This says start at A, go to B, whereas we have here B, go to A. Something else that we can do is we can label edges with information. So you'll notice that each of our edges here has either zero or one. And while we're not, it's not explained what those labels are for, we could perhaps be using them to do calculations or things like that. They, they contain more information about the graph. So the third type of graph that we might have is a multigraph. And this is a set of vertices with a set of edges. And here we're allowing, notice we're allowing multiple edges between the same two vertices and we're also allowing loops. So this gives us the kind of fullest generality, but often we don't need um, a multigraph to describe the system we're interested in.
and most for most of this course we're going to focus on simple directed and undirected graphs. Now we've already mentioned this a little bit, but we can also include labels on our graph. And this can be true for directed or undirected graphs, and they just convey information about the edge that we're talking about. So we know that a simple graph is a graph, let's just remind ourselves, that has no loops and no parallel edges. So we can start to ask a question, How, if we have a certain number of vertices, what's the maximum number of edges that is possible if we have no loops or parallel edges? And if we have a graph which has the maximum possible number of edges, it's called a complete graph. Each vertex is connected by a single edge to each of the other vertices. So we can think about drawing some of these. For example, K1, the complete graph on one vertex, well, that doesn't have any edges because we're not allowing any loops. On the other hand, if we look at K2, which is the simple graph on two vertices, well, the only thing that we can do is really join those two. If we have a look at K3, now we have three vertices, and in order to connect them, we have three edges. And if we have a look at K4, then let's see, we we'll, we need to connect that vertex to the other three. And now we have three more connections, so we get a graph that looks like this. So I haven't got any parallel edges or loops. And you can you can do some thinking but you'll start to see that if you want to know how many edges an n-vertex complete graph has, it's a half times n times n minus 1. So this is a useful formula that you will need to know. So now we start to think a little bit more about describing graphs, and we come up with the idea of the degree of a vertex. So we're talking about undirected graphs here, and we're talking about a vertex on it, and we say that the degree of that vertex is the number of edges that connect it to other vertices in the graph. So, for example, if I sketched this little directed graph, and I was interested in the degree of V1, it's the number of edges connecting V to the other vertices, and I've got three. I've got one, two, three edges, so the degree of this vertex is three. But we can also talk about directed graphs. But here, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the out degree, which is the number of edges that start at V. And then we have the in degree, which is the number of edges that end at V. So, for example, if I had a similar looking graph with four vertices, but now my edges are directed, Then I would have a look and I would say, okay, the out degree of vertex 1 is all the edges that start at V1. Well, that's this edge and this edge. So our out degree is equal to 2. And our in degree is the number of edges that end at V1. And in this case, it's just 1. And then we can build up what's called the degree sequence of an undirected graph. So here we're thinking about this, where we basically just list the degrees 
of each vertex ordered from the highest degree down to the lowest. So take a moment to look at each of these graphs and work out the degrees of each vertex and then come back and check when you're done. So let's just check through looking at the degrees for each of the vertices in these two graphs. Now the first at least four vertices for our undirected graph are pretty straightforward, but you might have been wondering about the vertices V5 and V6. And the trick to counting the degrees of a vertex which has, for example, loops, is to imagine that you're zooming in to that vertex. And now, if you have a look, you can just see that there's one, two, three things coming off that vertex. And the same goes for V5. And so that's why we have for de the degree of V5 and V6 is 3. So now let's have a look at this directed graph. And again, things are pretty straightforward, except if we're looking at B over here, which again has a loop. And the trick here would be to imagine zooming in and now putting in the little arrows that you might be expecting to see. So we see that we have that's definitely one arrow going in. This over here is part of an arrow that goes out. Next we have an arrow going in. Over here we have another arrow going in. And if we imagine this line over here, the direction of this edge at that point is going out. And so when we come to look at our vertex B, our in degree, the number of things pointing in, is 1, 2, 3, and the number pointing out is 2. Just so that you can check, you've seen in both examples that we have vertices which don't have any edges going in, so they have a degree or an in or out degree of 0. So here we have another example to have a look at, and we're going to extend our ideas on the degrees of vertices using this example. So take a moment to work through parts A, B, and C. So we want to write down the degree of each vertex in the graph, and then we're going to work out the sum of the vertex degrees for each graph, and then we're going to think about the answer that we get. So take a moment and write down the degree of each vertex, and then add them up. 